Welcome everyone to one of the webinars associated with the um, SSMC um, Data Hackathon, which is going to be coming up in January at Lehigh University. Um, and so um, in preparation for that, or already getting started for that, we have, we're hosting a series of webinars. Um, today is um, today we have um, Professor Anton Olenik from um, Manhattan College. Um, you know, Anton um, started out with his, getting his bachelor's and his master's degree at um, Ivan Franco National University in um, Lviv in the Ukraine. And then he moved to um, University of Alberta to work with Arthur Marr for his um, PhD. And I had the pleasure of, of seeing um, his thesis defense. And really, um, Anton was, um, you know, I think, you know, paving the way for starting to use machine, machine learning ideas to chemical or uh, materials chemistry problems. And I, I think this was really just when things were getting started with this. And so after finishing his PhD, um, Anton then went to the University of Houston to work with um, Jacob Roch, um, where he continued using these types of um, machine learning ideas, as well as, um, you know, Anton also has a side of doing lots of solid state synthesis and making amazing compounds. And so um, it was fun to see. Um, and so since then, he's been at Manhattan College where he started his independent career. So I mean, Anton's going to be talking about um, machine learning descriptors and materials chemistry. So please go ahead, Anton. Thank you very much for the introduction, Danny. It is my pleasure to give a talk here today. And uh, yes, uh, as always, I, I definitely... I'm very delighted to give a talk here as SM see that meeting. It's very important, obviously, and the purpose of this meeting is to spark collaborations between data scientists and also experimentalists. And maybe we can have some common projects and so on. So I'm sort of like, uh, I have both of the backgrounds, I would say. I definitely started doing machine learning relatively, um, relatively, well, a long time ago, I would say, almost like 10 years ago, I started doing it, but my background is definitely not materials informatics or any kind of informatics. I started as an experimentalist and I really do do I really do like experiments. I really like doing experimental validation of the machine learning predictions that I create with computers. And obviously I'm just here being somewhere in the middle between like people who have only experimentalist background and people who have informatics background. So I will probably just want to introduce you to sort of like quite a simple research, nothing fancy in terms of informatics, nothing, nothing fancy in terms of like experiments and to show you definitely that you can do both of these and you can definitely belong to both of the worlds. Uh, I'm at Manhattan College, which is primarily undergraduate institution. So I do research with undergraduate students and they're still quite amazing students. They work quite hard. And I also this summer, I was delighted to mentor a student from a different institution the Cooper Union, quite a well-known engineering school as well. Today, we'll try to focus a little bit on the descriptors and the data that we use for classification of crystal structures, which is not a very common topic, to be honest, in materials. In materials, we most commonly, we do regression models, but classification is also sort of like important. And I will demonstrate how we create our own list of descriptors and how we can use this list of descriptors to predict new compounds and actually make them in the labs. So machine learning definitely is super popular nowadays. Specifically that, uh, well, it, it's used everywhere, like from um, sort of like recommendation engines for Netflix and Amazon, with character recognitions, facial recognitions, and so on. In the early 2000s, I was amazed by the technology of that time. Like, oh, I can, I can just give a program a handwritten text and then just convert it into like a digital text. I was just amazed, like, obviously, how is it possible? And only later on, I learned that it's all due to machine learning. And how do we actually differ machine learning from the rest of um, amazing things that people do, like statistics, for example. According to this graph here, machine learning, it doesn't really overlap much with statistics, but I would say in material science, it, it goes like hand in hand with each other, obviously. 
since you start doing it because you love statistics and then you want to expand it a little bit and try to see, oh, is there like any trend of the statistics? How can I use the statistics to predict something new? And then you slowly migrate into machine learning. That's why probably I just keep using the same terminology that I use for statistics, like regression and classification. While in machine learning, someone with informatics background would probably prefer saying like supervised learning. Okay, so definitely nowadays there are so many fields like you can also say that you're working like in AI and you won't be wrong because machine learning is part of AI. And also it is in specifically in materials, uh, when you do machine learning and statistics, you obviously will also be doing a lot of data mining. You will be analyzing it and all of your decisions that you do in the lab will be also data driven. I started my journey in, in materials informatics and machine learning very long time ago, 2014. And I started with as a collaboration between Taylor Sparks, who is also present here, and one of the hosts of this meeting, and Michael Goltos, at that time a student at UCSB. And Michael contacted me and asked me if I can make a new compound that they predicted. They predicted it to be a new thermoelectric material, while it was very, very different in terms of composition from all other thermoelectric materials. It was very metallic. It consisted of a lot of gadolinium, cobalt, and bismuth. It is quite, uh, not, not, not quite typical for thermoelectrics to actually have that high content of metallic elements. And we actually uh, created the compound, we made it and we measured, and it was a new class of thermoelectric materials. I was so excited doing this work in collaboration that at some point I started to do machine learning myself and try to explore what we can use it for. My real passion with machine learning is the prediction of crystal structures, specifically intermetallics. And a long time ago, I just also did the prediction of a new compound that has a very simple composition, 1-1 simplest AB compounds. And it was the first AB compound that was predicted and made in the last 30 years because people believed that all of the binary compounds with the simplest stoichiometry one to one ratio of their indices are already found, but actually we predicted and formed a new one. Also, we expanded it to ternary compounds and so on. After that, we predicted many different uh, crystal structures, specifically like Hoislers, half Hoislers, quaternary Hoislers, and many, many others. I continued my journey there. There was a, a more of a study of the application and how we can use machine learning to predict new super hard materials. Again, it was a collaboration during my postdoc times with Jacob Bogosh and collaboration with Taylor Sparks from the University of Utah. And we just, in probably in just only six months, we predicted and synthesized two new super hard materials, which is not so easy to do, but was at the help of machine learning, they actually did it. And it was like, just, it was just blowing my mind. Like, oh, machine learning can be that successful. I was so inspired by that. Also, we did quite a lot of collaborations, uh, like predicting solar cells and optimizing them. And when I moved to New York City, I just decided to spice up my research a little bit and try to predict new uranium containing intermetallics and definitely predicting their structures. And this is actually what I will be talking about today, how we can predict and synthesize new intermetallic uranium containing compounds. So obviously classification is my passion, but it doesn't mean that this is all, everything like that I do. I also do quite a lot of regression problems and specifically through collaborations. Uh, recently, we tried to predict uh, intermetallic superconductors and intermetallic superconductors are definitely quite common. And uh, what actually sparked my interest there is like looking at this heat map where the red elements are the ones that are the most common in intermetallic superconductors. I also noticed that elements like technetium, uranium, they're also quite common in intermetallic superconductors. And in collaboration with Wei Wei, um, and she's now in Michigan State University, we just created the model and we are looking forward to do some uh, experimental validation of this model to synthesize and measure new superconductors, especially containing uranium. Also, in collaboration with Dr. Klanke from Waterloo, uh, we just recently explored different methods to predict uh, ultra, ultra low thermal conductivity, especially ultra conductivity under one watt per meter Kelvin. It's definitely also is very well used for, um, for thermoelectric materials. So it was also quite a successful predictions and that's how regression problems look.
But what about classification? Classification problems are very uncommon in material science, I would say. Uh, let's start with classification to explain what it means and what are the possible pitfalls there. You are doing machine learning, specifically classification, without even knowing it sometimes. Probably everyone sees, uh, at least once, have seen this kind of picture, this kind of puzzles that you need to solve in order to pass the verification test. And what you're actually doing here, you're just basically training the machine learning model in terms of classification. So here you just need to click on palm trees, and then this way you verify that you're a human being, not a machine. So the funny thing here is that you can actually click on random pictures sometimes and still pass this test with verification. Because, well, maybe someone is using this test in order to train their model and they just want you to pick the palm trees and they really trust you. So you're basically serving them as someone who trains the machine learning model. Because the actual verification test like this, it just works based on the time it takes you to select the images, not based on the correct answer. But we definitely want to be responsible, right? And we just want to click definitely on the palm trees to, um, well, let the algorithm be very successful. And this way, actually, someone can create a huge database of images that are associated with some certain like picture. And this way, we actually can uh, create a great classifier and do some other predictions with machine learning later on. Classification is a funny thing. So it really is not about like the math behind it. It's not about like the fancy methods, the fancy algorithms we use. It's sometimes it's just about your understanding of a problem and your understanding of your own data. So this is like an example of an algorithm which was created to classify huskies and wolves. They definitely look very similar to us. And we wanted to see like, no, not we, but like the people who studied and created this algorithm, they wanted to see like, if you can actually differentiate between husky and wolf. And they actually created amazing classifier. But the problem was that the problem was in their data. It's just that majority of pictures taken, taken of wolves, they had wolves on a snow background. And majority of pictures with husky, they had actually grass as a background. And obviously, this was the model that classified, is it husky or wolf, just based on the background. So this is something that we definitely need to avoid in materials. We just definitely need to understand our data. Is there anything else that can bias it, bias our model and create very successful, very accurate model, but it is solving not the problem that we wanted it to solve. Another example of it is definitely classification. Is something an Apple or is something an iPod? So the funny thing here, obviously, that if you want to classify you definitely need to take pictures of these objects from different sides. And funny thing, iPod had engraved these four letters, iPod, on their back. That's why you had a lot of data and that you actually, well, you literally had the name written there on the device, which is definitely biased your model and created a model which is super successful in terms of math. It just created a fantastic model, but it wasn't super useful and super helpful for the actual predictions of objects. So it was biased in some certain way. So just to give you an idea, uh, what I'm talking here about is that when you do machine learning, very often people just focus on their input data. They just outsource it, give it to someone with like informatics background and they create machine learning model. So they really focus too much about like methods and about like trying different fancy algorithms like more decision trees, more neural networks, more neurons in our neural networks. And sometimes they forget that like your input data is super important. And two components that make it up is database and your features. Just to illustrate you that how important database and features are, and just so we avoid in the future creating some useless models, I just created a very quick model out of the piece of my data, uh, AB compounds. And this is a very simple model, PLSDA partial least square discriminant analysis method. And I just wanted to see if I can classify the compounds. So this model works so-so. You can't really impress anyone like saying that it's super fantastic. It separates classes. Not quite, but there is some sort of like a gradual separation there. 
But if I tell you what data I used for this, you definitely will see right away that this wasn't a good model because the data I used for this as features was very random things like the date of discovery element, which definitely has nothing to do with the real chemistry that's going on in compounds or the number of letters in element name. Obviously it has nothing else to do. But this is just the purpose of this figure just to illustrate you that no matter what data you feed to your machine, it will give you algorithms. And if you push it too hard and if you overfit it, it will give you a perfect model. But if there is really no chemistry behind the data that you feed in, this is just basically is going to be like a useless model. That's why it's very important not to focus too much on the method, but as a solid state chemist, we also need to understand our data, where it comes from, what are the possible errors in it, and is there anything funky going on with your data overall? Just to give you an idea, you always need to double check like database. Do I really trust this data? What might be a potential problem there? And also features, where do they come from? Features are simply numbers that describe your data. So just to give you an idea what, what databases, uh, database errors might be, this is like one simple example from Pearson's crystal data. We really love this database. It's very nice very high quality data, but sometimes there are some interesting reports. For example, copper fluoride was reported in 1933. And the problem is that it was only reported once in 1933. And after that, there were like 15 papers citing this work saying that this compound doesn't exist. And even Wikipedia knows that this compound doesn't exist, but we went so far that we even created like the CAS numbers the identifier number, which by the way, takes quite a lot of like bureaucratic work to actually create this number for a compound. And only later we found out that this compound even doesn't exist, but we still have it in the database. So this is something that you might be, uh, well, you might keep in mind next time you work with the data. What else might be there? So for example, there might be simple typos. So it is very, very hard work to put in the compounds, the correct formulas. And we really appreciate when there are people actually creating these databases for us. But sometimes typos can happen. So for example, here, the phase formula that we see is uranium-3, ruthenium-2. And someone was entering this formula four times in the database, obviously, but as we can see, the actual title of the manuscript says the formula is different. It is uranium-2, ruthenium-3. Obviously, it is like an honest mistake and like we can't really blame someone who composed this database. We really appreciate their work, but sometimes just simple mistakes as this, when you just flip two indices, it can happen. And you always need to double check your data and filter it somehow, even with machine, algorithm, machine learning algorithm, you can always like clean your data and um, see if there are any outliers or is there's like any problem in it. Also, if you use other databases, like for example, high throughput calculation databases, the materials project, uh, I would consider it to be quite a high quality data nowadays, obviously. Uh, when we started using it in 2016, it had some problems once in a while. For example, we were creating a model for super hard materials and we noticed that some of the data points in that database, well, they actually, um, they they actually have like incorrect shear modulus, incorrect bulk modulus, which probably resulted from some problems in the elastic constants they were calculated with DFT. And these problems were fixed later on, but just to give you an idea, sometimes even very high quality databases like the materials project or Pearson's crystal data, they can have issues. That's about data. So you always need to keep in mind that the best quality data you can get, it's probably for, from your own lab or someone who you trust, maybe your collaborators. But commercial databases are also quite helpful. What about features? How much you can trust them? Um, this is probably an incorrect question, how much uh, you can trust them for a simple reason, because, well, you're the one who selects what features you want to use. It's totally up to you. It's totally up to your background, your sort of like chemical intuition, what features you want to use. And well, I just decided to create my own list of features, which I'm gladly sharing with everyone who asks me for this. This is basically a very huge 
a huge Excel file that has many different properties like electronegativity scales of various elements, size scales of like all the elements I could find, all the different physical properties and so on. What we are using it for? We are using it to describe our data. We just use a formula and from the formula we calculate, for example, radius ratio, very familiar parameter to us, or electronegativity difference, also very widely used. So this is how I do it. And very early I just realized that it's probably better for me to put together a list of properties that work very well for the compounds of my interest, specifically intermetallics, but also people reported in other studies that they actually really appreciate it and they also could use it and successfully create new compounds, new materials with it. I also highly appreciate the work from uh, Taylor Sparks and at that time his graduate students, uh, Kai, who actually tried to test many different featureizers and he, they named like this data set that I will be talking about. Uh, they just named it after me and they just actually showed that they demonstrated that it works super well for very small data sets. And in material science, it's very common size to have the data sets less than 1000 data points. You can start you doing machine learning probably if you have like a hundred data points, ideally a couple of hundreds, 1000, you sort of like a little bit pushing it too far because well, it takes a lot of work to put together 1000 data point file. But beyond that, there are definitely other featureizers that perform better. So I was really inspired by this and I just decided to put together, together more and more properties so that we can have very efficient file uh, with different properties. Just to compare my list, there is this is nothing really impressive, to be honest, in terms of the number of features. But we need to remember that it's not only about the number of features, which we had only 93, it's also about arith arithmetic operations that you can do with them. For example, like sum, ratio, difference, and so on. So you can easily bring this 93 number to a couple of thousand if you really work through your features and really come up with some interesting formulas. Okay, how do we actually do the calculations based on the composition? There are a couple of different ways you can featureize your data. One is the composition derived features. Another set is the structure derived features. They ideally, if you can have both of them, sometimes you can limit yourself if you use the structure derived features simply because, well, you will need to know the structure of your material before you predict its properties and so on. Composition derived features are probably easier to calculate and if we are doing it like almost every day, it's very easy, very straightforward. You basically have your values from the property file like radius, electronegativity. You come up with the different mathematical equations and then you basically calculate your features. And that's where machine learning starts because you can use these features for the predictions. And obviously the more data you have in your file, the more features you can generate and create. So, so visualization could be understood like as a simple, for example, uh, molar mass calculation. The very first thing that we do in CAM 101, basically, we just have formula, formula has elements in their indices. We just sum up the atomic weight multiplied by their indices, or in other words, weighed by their atomic ratio. And then we basically just create our first feature, which would be like the molar mass. This is the very simple principle. And you don't actually need to know any programming at all because you can do all these simple calculations even in Excel. The feature list, it has 93 properties that we put together, just to give you an idea, various electronegativity scales. Um, there are close to 25 electronegativity scales. I would say not all of them are complete. That's why in our list, we only selected a couple of them. And many different size scales that also have some gaps, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And different, definitely like a lot of different properties, density, boiling point, melting point, and so on. Uh, that also might be very helpful for the prediction or in classification of crystal structures. Overall, I did probably around like 10 experimentally validated machine learning studies and uh, even more well, experimentally validating, validated machine learning studies were done by other researchers using this list of properties, which I highly value as well. 
Uh, another interesting thing that I didn't really find a lot in other featureizers is the list of properties that are related to the nuclear properties. This is super helpful since I focus also on prediction of new crystal structures on uranics and transuranics. And it might not be very helpful for you if you just work with like common elements and nothing really extraordinary there. Uh, but still, if you're you, if you're doing some very interesting and very highly specialized chemistry, it's definitely worth to put together your own list of features, your own list of properties, because it will definitely advance your model. Uh, also, there were some properties like abundance, HHI, which is economic factor index, and cost, something that can help you to screen for materials. So for example, you predicted bunch of materials and not all of them perform like very well, let's say. Some of them are like mediocre, right? Some somewhere in the middle. Uh, but if that material is very cheap to produce, why not go for it? So this might be also some factor that you might consider after you predicted materials and you just want to screen entire database and to see what are the most economically effective materials, what are like the most sustainable materials or something like this. Also, just to give you an idea, the property list uh, for the classification and other predictions, it has some gaps. Some gaps we indi indicated as NA values. Obviously, some of them are definitely NA and are not physically possible, for example, uh, like uh, for most of uh, inert gases, different like ionization energies and and everything else. They are not very meaningful, I would say, for the prediction problems. Uh, but sometimes something like the size scale, there are missing values, but we could successfully predict them. So all these yellow highlighted values, they were missing at the very beginning of our study. So we had also an A there. But in machine learning, there are methods that cannot truly really tolerate some gaps in data. For example, like support vector machine, it's very sensitive to it. You need to have a full set of data. Uh, you can't have missing values. Uh, you probably, what you can do, you can probably replace the missing values with the best guess, not ideal. But here we just put the best guess for you already. So we just enhance this property list with just predicted by machine learning values. In other words, for example, there is like a, um, let's say like effective ionic radius for one element absent. What we could do, we could just use all other properties, all other 92 properties that are not that specific uh, effective ionic radius value and then predict the missing values. And this way we just have the best guess, the best of the best guess we can put there so that you can use this property and this specific value that was missing before to apply for your methods that require the complete data set. How we did that? We did it with our undergraduate students. It was very interesting study. So for example, I will show you only one case, a study of the miracle radius. Miracle here is the last name. It's basically the size that's derived from metallic glasses. As size, definitely atomic sizes, they could be derived from many different classes of compounds from many different properties, or they can also be calculated. And this specific miracle radius is derived from metallic glasses. And we decided to predict, can we use machine learning to predict the values? So for example, all these points right here, these are uh, this, all the circles, these are the reported values. And we tried different methods, even the fancy ones. We tried like neural networks, we tried support vector regression, all different kinds of them. Uh, but we couldn't actually get the right trend. So ideally, if we had like this line following the same trend, it just means that, oh, now we can predict the missing values because we can capture the trend here. And after a couple of attempts, we actually found out that, okay, there are methods that can help us to predict the missing values. Uh, decision tree was one of the successful methods. However, it had some problems there. Because of uh, the number of data points were not so huge, it was predicting the values of the nearby atoms, the same idea, uh, the same absolute values that are of the elements that are next to them. For example, uh, hydrogen, helium, and lithium over here, they had the same identical miracle radius, which wasn't ideal, but Gaussian method, GPR, predicted it quite well. And what is super important here that it could extrapolate the values. If you can look at here, the very first element was atomic number one, 
hydrogen had the smallest radius. And it is very hard for machine learning to extrapolate the values and predict the extremes, the smallest, the largest. And here it actually could capture it that each period basically ends or starts with like quite a small value and just goes up, goes up, goes up and so on. So the trend was there and we actually predicted the value and we then we populated our table with these predicted values and use it to predict new compounds. Predicted new compounds uh, it will be just a very short definitely information here, but different people have different approaches, I must say. So you can start it like from a sort of like a philosophical point of view. How do we know that there should be new compounds? Or you can start with a chemical intuition. So you sort of like see a very complicated phase diagram and you want to focus on it and try to find out are there new compounds. If we look at our databases, it also gives us an idea where to start as well. Nature, it prefers very simple structures. And if we just put together the 10 most common structure reports in the databases, we start with quite a simple cesium fluoride type structure. Then we go to materials which are associated with the properties because we are biased towards functional materials. We always want something that has interesting magnetic properties. And also we have simple structures as well, magnetic properties or superconductors and then simpler structures again. So it is like a mixture of functional reports that we definitely reported a lot, especially in the eighties and the simplest structures. Again, this is like Hoistler as an example of a simpler structure and at the same time, interesting because of its magnetic properties. Spinels, the same thing, quite simple, but at the same time, very functional magnetic properties and perovskites, everyone loves perovskites. But the most common structure type in the databases is unknown. So there are so many compounds that had just the composition reported, but no one knows what their structures is. And if you want to predict new compounds, this is the way to start. You just take this, the most common cl class of compounds, the question mark, and try to predict what might be its crystal structure. Also, you can approach it through like harmonic series, basically, and plot the per atomic percent of elements for the binaries, ternaries, quaternaries, and so on. And at some point you will realize that the most common reports have the same atomic ratios that correspond to the intervals, similar how we have it in music intervals, like the octave, uh, perfect fifth, perfect fourth, major six, I believe, and so on. And it just continues on and on and on. So this is like a harmonic series here, which gives us an idea where might be more compounds with a specific ratio of elements. You can also plot the ratio of elements and try to see if the compounds, because these are indices put here, uh, what compounds, compound stoichiometries could be missing there. So for example, there probably might be more compounds with one-to-one with -one stoichiometry because we just want to get sort of like a Gaussian distribution of, of this number of compounds. So predicting new crystal structures, it's definitely not a new problem. It has been solved, at least there were some attempts over a hundred years ago. The probably the well-known attempt that made it to the chemistry textbooks is the radius ratio rules by Linus Pauling. It was in 1920s. He proposed like a very simple idea that from geometry, we can predict what structure will be adopted. And radius ratio rule is basically the simplest case of sort of like machine learning done with pen and paper. If you can have the radii, you can figure out what might be the structure. The Linus Pauling had that great idea at the time when uh, the, the X-ray diffraction, the method that we used to find out the crystal structure was just emerging and everyone was doing it. So he was so fascinated with it that he tried even to propose like, oh, maybe we don't, we don't even need to do refraction to find out what the structure is in case if we, if we are smart and we use math. And that attempts were some of the first classification attempts. And if we plot, for example, A, B structure reports, we will see that these attempts to classify crystal structure, they happen all the time, right after we have a great spike of interest of that specific stoichiometry. And the number of 
reports is sort of like a plateaus there. So in 1920s, end of 1920s, this is where Linus Pauling tried to actually classify crystal structures and also around that time proposed the electronegativity scale. There were many electronegativity scales proposed, but you can see that the peak interest in the new electronegativity scales, it was right around the time when we try to classify more and more crystal structures, especially the AB crystal structures. And the next great classification attempt, it happened in uh, around 1980s and by people like Zunger, uh, Petifor, Villars. And some of these classification of crystal structures are, are known to us as these figures. So for example, Villars used the chemical descriptor as the size and electronegativity difference. And Petifor went even further. He introduced its own scale, the chemical scale, that is basically the numbers that he assigned to elements in order to classify crystal structures. His idea was very simple. And what we know nowadays is basically his idea is more or less the same as we now understand the dimensionality reduction. He tried to reduce this problem of binary compounds a classification to just two numbers, chemical scale of element A, chemical scale of element B, and try to see if he could classify it. That's basically the structure map used by the dimensionality reduction technique, but through the human being. Nowadays, we definitely have fancier techniques. The one that I favor is a support vector machine, and it's quite visual. Uh, it has a couple of parameters. The main ones are the gamma and cost parameter, which basically dictate the area, the classification area, and the smoothness of the surface and the influence around each data point. It is quite intuitive what this means, as long as you look at this graph and try to imagine this as, as classification problems, uh, the points, the blue points, the red points. And if you put like a random place, like an unknown point, what would it be? Would it belong to the blue guys or to the red guys? This is like the classification that we are trying to solve as crystal structures here. In order to quantify it, because sometimes predictions could be successful or not, we definitely split our data into training and validation set. And we use statistics such as true positive predictions and true negative predictions. Part of the data, we just leave it uh, aside so that the model doesn't even know about its existence, but we know the true values of the data. And then we try to use this data to predict what would be the the class. And then if we guess it correctly, then definitely it is like a true positive prediction. There are a couple of uh, parameters that we can talk about, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. And obviously, uh, in order to validate the feature list that we just proposed, 93 great properties, can we actually predict a new compound with it? And we actually did. And I will just show you what kind of problem we tried to solve. So the AB compounds, it was too simple. It was already solved. Even that uh, we are going to publish soon an update on that, uh, not a very trivial problem. So AB compounds, there will be also some new compounds coming up soon. But for today, I just want to show you a, another interesting case of AB3 compounds. Also one of the simplest stoichiometries. There are only uh, seven, no, eight, uh, most common structure types that have at least 20 representatives. So the number of representatives, the third column here, it is quite important parameter because we want to make sure that we have enough number of representatives so that statistics are meaningful. The space group numbers also tell you that, uh, well, the structures, they prefer to have the higher symmetry here. So this one, 200 something space group, it tells you that the symmetry of that space group is like cubic hexagonal. So it's very highly symmetrical one. We created the labels for each class and also tried to analyze it from the chemical point of view, just to estimate how hard would it be to separate two crystal classes, sorry, not classes, two crystals, two structure types that get assigned in different classes in terms of homoatomic and heteroatomic interactions. In other words, do we have more of the atoms of its kind forming bonds between themselves or atoms of a different kind forming bonds between themselves? And when we do the classification, at first glance, it looks like we have very successful predictions with high sensitivity and specificity statistics for most of the classes. 
And the ones that we can separate easily are the ones that look totally different from each other. For example, this class one, class two, and class five, all of them have quite high statistics in terms of like sensitivity and specificity. And even visually, they look very different to us. They have different number of bonds between the atoms. They have different sizes of the atoms. So even for machine learning, as well as for us from the visual point of view, it's very easy to classify this crystal structure with just simple parameters as the size ratio, for example. But there are also classes like class four here that looks quite horrible. We can do correctly that true negative predictions with the highest specificity ratio, but it fails miserably when we try to predict truly the class four. How it looks, so I'll just give you an idea. This is our statistics, which show us the prediction probability for class one, the copper three gold type over here. And all the points closer to the 100% probability are the copper three gold type structure. And all other compounds with different colors, with different points here, they belong to other structure types and ideally they all should have like as close as possible to zero probability for their prediction and as we can see the class four the one that had quite bad statistics it's also quite visually obvious to us yes that we have uh, we have a lot of confusion going on here for our machine learning model since well it predicts the compounds that belong to class four as class one to some extent quite good, I would say, around, around, around like 60% to 80%, some of them. So this structure type, which actually visually looks quite similar to class one, and in terms of the sizes of the atoms as well, and in terms of coordination as well. So it also causes a confusion for our machine learning model to predict it correctly and specifically to separate these two classes correctly. Something that looks totally different, like class five over here, Obviously, it was very easy to differentiate this class five and class one because visually for us right here in this picture, they look very different chemically. They're also very different. We decided to test a new compound with uranium and cadmium and try to predict what would be the probability of this compound forming in a specific crystal structure type, which is over three gold right here. And first, you probably see that this value is not is not very high. It is okay for the noisy models, the one that is over here as well. Uh, but this model has to be noisy simply because we also included in this model polymorphs. In other words, the compounds that actually belong to two or more different crystal structure types at the same time. And it's interesting because for machine learning, definitely it's like a challenge when you have polymorphs, when there are more than one class that the compound belongs to, it always will cause problems. And these, the guys over here with this gray shaded area right here, and they definitely are very messy. That's why taking that into account, having the compound uranium cadmium three right here, having only 64% probability, which is super high compared to all other probabilities, but being the fourth highest probability out of our unknowns, probably guided us towards going to the lab and doing the synthesis. At some time ago, uh, with Taylor Sparks and other great machine learning chemists, we published like uh, uh, best practices guidelines that we definitely summarized, like how to make your uh, work reproducible, how to make people really appreciate your work and make it clear for them, all the instructions, all the steps and so on. And it could be summarized in three simple um, statements, like be transparent with what you do, be competent with what you do, make sure your model is reproducible. Someone else can take your data and create like the same model. And I just want to add the fourth one from me. You need to provide experimental validation. So eventually it doesn't matter how good or how bad your statistics are, but as long as your machine learning model can guide you towards new material that did success in my opinion. And being experimentalist, Obviously, I just want to go directly to the synthesis and then use powder refraction to find out to find out actually if it exists or not. So going to the lab, uh, we work with uranium. And as Homer Simpson said, uh, radiation can harm you only if you believe in radiation. 
uh, we definitely need to follow a better better safety guidelines here. Obviously, working with uranium is no fun. Uh, you definitely need to keep in mind that, well, this might be dangerous. So you definitely need to have all the equipment, all the glove boxes ready for that and so on. But machine learning is ideal for working with elements like uranium because you cannot really do uh, exploratory synthesis with radioactive elements simply because, well, it is too risky. You can't just afford simply mixing random elements, hoping that you will form new compound. But if you have a very good calculation from DFT guiding you or machine learning guiding you, then this is a good reason to go to the lab and try to form a new compound. For example, uranium cadmium compound, it wasn't quite obvious from the intuitive point of view uh, that that compound should exist. Within this list and the periodic table on the right, we see that the compounds with the structure type copper three gold having uranium and other elements, the other elements are nothing really close to cadmium, to be honest. These are either P-block elements or some elements from the iron family. Even if the, we expanded from binary compounds to like ternary compounds or like pseudo ternary compounds and include some solubility of elements, we still see that it never has been anything similar to uranium cadmium reported before. So probably no one in right mind would ever try to synthesize the compound with cadmium and uranium in the structure type copper three gold because of the chemical intuition. It's not so obvious, but if machine learning guides you towards that structure, this is a good reason to try. So we did machine learning, obviously, and predicted the structure should be high enough probability that it should exist in that specific copper three gold structure type. We can do experiments, obviously, in a couple of different ways. These are intermetallics, high temperature is required. You either do uh, sintering from the pressed pellet or arc melting of the pressed pellet. Then you seal it in a tube and you anneal it to get the sample. And then you analyze with powder refractor. But with uranium, it's not so easy, and especially with cadmium, because all these tiny dots that you see on the ampule over here, this is the uh, cadmium that crystallized on the colder side of the tube. So it's very hard to control composition. Also, cadmium is a very volatile element. Also, uranium is hard to work with as well. It has many allotrope modifications at the temperatures of the synthesis of solid state synthesis. Also, uranium, it also reacts with silica tube as well. So a lot of different things that you need to keep in mind when you're synthesizing. And when I was planning experiment, I just noticed one interesting thing. Uranium has quite a lot of interesting allotrope modifications. It's very unusual, to be honest, to have metals with that many allotrope modifications. If we think about it carefully, with the high temperature synthesis range, somewhere between 400 and like 1200 degrees Celsius, the typical temperature range, we can have up to four reactants that have the same composition, uranium, but will react differently if you mix it at the right stage of the reaction. So the approach that I use, I just simply separate my reaction tube into sort of like a precursor reactant here and uranium, which we heat separately to a certain temperature. For example, here to get the cubic uh, gamma uranium, which has very similar structure to the targeted structure. And when we heat it up so that we get the allotrope modification that we want, and then we flip over the reaction tube, and allow specifically gamma uranium reacting with your other precursor, this is the way actually to grow the structure, which is similar to the structure of gamma uranium. This definitely is about like reaction mechanisms and how we understand it. Still, nowadays we have very little idea what are the true reaction mechanisms. Our organic colleagues are probably like 100 years ahead of us because they have many different synthesis mechanisms like SN2 mechanism and many other different things with organic molecules. But in solid state chemistry, we are not so lucky. We don't have so many different like allotropes available to us readily or some other techniques that we can use. Usually it's just simple as shake and bake method. You just press the elements together and hope that the compound will form. 
So here, this approach, I just use it a little bit different because I was targeting like a specific allotrope of uranium and flip over the tube only when we reach that specific transition in order for it to react. This approach actually could be done with many other elements, uh, but looking at the different allotropes uh, from the D and F block elements, and most of them, there are different allotropes for the F elements. And some of them definitely like transuranic elements like plutonium, having a lot of interesting allotropes, which definitely from the synthetic point of view, you can try and you probably will find a lot of different chemistries there. Also, if you want to explore a little bit of high pressure to synthesis, it's also possible because uh, allotrope modifications under 10 GPA pressure, they, well, if element has allotrope modifications under 10 GPA pressure, most likely they will also will have some compounds that exist, well, different modifications under pressure up to 10 GPA as well, according to some statistics that I just decided to dig up from the database. So there is a lot of playground in a simpler way, similar way to what I just described with uranium and synthesis of uranium cadmium-3. Obviously, we did X-ray diffraction to prove that the compound that we formed is, is definitely the structure that we predicted. We did single, well, not single powder diffraction here. The diffraction experiment, we obviously all are familiar with this. But fun fact, uh, the person who actually introduced fast Fourier transform method was the person who graduated from our tiny school from Manhattan College a long, long time ago and had a very successful career in math as well. So we did the X-ray diffraction and we formed samples. Sample was non-equilibrium. Uh, it had, when, when you have like basically two reactants, you would expect that you can have only two phases there if this is thermodynamic like stable conditions, if it is like you achieved um, homogeneity there in your sample. But because of the synthesis techniques that we were using, we didn't expect to have it like the, the the conditions for only two phases present. Instead of it, we actually made four phases there. A lot of unreacted uranium, bunch of uranium oxide, a lot of unreacted cadmium, which is by the way, is very volatile, and some unknown peaks. And these unknown peaks, they matched very well the intensity of the structure that we just predicted with machine learning. Even that our machine learning algorithm predicted the structured to have this copper three gold type was only 64%, but we could make it and we made it, made this compound in this very structure that we just predicted. This probably gives you a good idea how I combined my background as material scientist, synthetic material scientist, as well as, as someone who has some experience with materials informatics to put it together in quite a simple case study. And I definitely, if you want, I can share with you my feature list so you can start doing sort of like a similar studies. And I definitely encourage you to go and do a lot of a lot more classifications of crystal structures in machine learning because this is very rare, to be honest. People are definitely targeting mostly properties. They really go after properties. They want to like get the new high temperature superconductor or new, the best performing thermoelectric materials. But there is also a lot of fun of classifying crystal structures and predicting with machine learning what crystal structure will form if you mix like two elements. I want to thank here uh, students who worked with me, one of the undergraduate students, Grihady from Manhattan College, and another student, Bob, um, who is from the Cooper, Cooper Union. And I also want to thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Hey. Great job. Um, yeah, great presentation, Anton. So. Um, any any questions from the audience? Um, I think we can, um, you can type in the chat and I'll read them out if, if that works. Well, while we're waiting for, um, for questions, I had one. Um, Anton, um, when, it, when, when you talk about um, experimental validation of the a machine learning model, um, how how far do you think one has to go with it to to say that it's really been validated? Because you know, if you 
if you say that there's a 60% chance that this structure might form in the gold copper three type, you know, um, do you really need to do 10 different examples and then see if you get it six, six out of 10 times or? I, I would say it depends like how much fun you're, ha you're having in the lab working on it. So if you're really confident in your model and you really believe that the compound should be there, it exists, no one stops you to try like 10 different samples. I would definitely do this uh, because I'm very passionate about crystal structures and predictions. Uh, but this question sort of like echoes with um, the situation, for instance, if like a DFT person tells you, oh, I just calculated the structure, it definitely should be there. And I calculated it. You should go to the lab and make it. I, re I really believe that it should be there. And you, you, you cannot convince them that you tried a hundred times and it didn't form. No, it's impossible to convince like someone who really trusts like their methods and really, really believe that the compound should be there. You can't tell that like it, it, it's impossible to form. Well, it's very highly possible that this compound will form if you try different conditions, you try different synthetic methods. So I definitely would believe my DFT colleagues who suggest that the compound should form. And I definitely will believe my machine learning model that the compound should form. And I will definitely try at least 10 times to make sure that I tried like all different methods to synthesize and confirm that it actually works. Mm -hmm. But obviously like from my experience, yeah, there are cases where you, when you work so hard in the lab, it still doesn't form. Well, mm -hmm. you're just out of luck in that case. Yeah, so I guess um, that that makes sense. And I, I I was thinking also the question of if you make ten different predictions, you should be right sixty percent of the time based on the statistics from the from the model, right? And so maybe the other the other solution is to make more predictions and try to try to find find those answers. So yes, I, I I'm hearing that the chat is actually disabled. Sorry about that. So yes, maybe you can go to the question and answer button and ask questions there. Okay, there should be question and answer. Oh, I see it. Yes. Yes. Just, it's my camera on top. It says uh, chat is disabled. Um, do I need to change it to something? I think I think people can type them in, type their questions yeah, in. I see the questions there. Yes, I see. I see the questions. So in case if you want to type them in. I see the questions there. I guess we're, while we're waiting, um, Anton, can you go to slide 22? Yes, I can. Oh, wait, maybe it's not 22. That was the slide where you were showing the results that the, oh, yes, here it is. So this question mark you have for the um, reports of compounds with no crystal structures, um, um, which database is this from? This uh, all this data is from Pearson's Crystal data. Okay. And, and question mar mark. It's literally something that says unknown prototype, which mm -hmm. sometimes means different things. Sometimes it is just an approximate composition and definitely no structure there. Sometimes it is just cell parameters but no crystal structure there. If you have cell parameters, actually it's very helpful information. So it, it definitely can help you to narrow down the possible structures that can form. Sometimes mm -hmm. these are just very old reports. So maybe the instrumentation back then wasn't so great. I mean, like the resolution, mm -hmm. all the things. So maybe it's worth going like back and trying to synthesize uh, the compounds again. So there might be various reasons. Yeah, I used to use the, the the big Pearson volumes, you know, that all of this tabulated, but I haven't really used the electronic database. Will it actually let you output a list of these structures that or these compounds that have unknown prototype structures? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it allows you to pull it out, but it's over 20,000. So <laughs> it really will take a lot of time to go through all of them and find out like the promising compositions. But it's definitely something like it's definitely a huge gap in the database, and we need we definitely need to fix this problem because there are so many compounds that there is a very high chance that they exist. We just don't know their structure yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like um, it's a very nice resource, though, and it shows you okay. Here's where a bunch of question marks are. Yeah, this is a to go look. Yeah.
what really amazes me is how, how nature prefers simplicity and like the most common structures are actually the simpler ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, this graph is not the representation of like all the structures that exist in the universe. Of course, we were focusing on a very specific, very narrow field like magnetic material or superconductors. And we were studying it like all day long, obviously studied it so much. That's why there are so many reports of Spinel's Hoistlers and high temperature, high TC cooperates rates and so on. But in fact, if we talk about from fundamental point of view, yes, the nature, it just prefers simplicity and they're like the classification really worth there because there probably might be more and more very simple structures that we are just missing. Excellent. Okay, we have a question in the chat or in the question and answer. Um, when predicting new materials, um, new materials, the size of elements seems to be intuitive. However, how do you consider um, valence electron counting for multiple structure types? Oh. I, how do you consider the interplay between electrical and geometrical constraints? Um, well, the easiest thing to do is just include as many features as possible with electrons and with sizes. And then just to see if there is like any correlation, especially when both of them contribute like equally to the model. There is a fantastic algorithm, which is called CISO, S-I-S-S-O, uh, which actually helps you to find an equation, which is phenomenal, this like fantastic thing. Everyone likes equations. It helps you to find the equation and the exact correlation, exact formula that involves both size factors and valence electrons, electron negativity, and so on, and put it together in one simple formula that shows you the equation that separates like two different structures. Uh, or you can use it also for regression. Fantastic, fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. So you could use that to like take those structure maps and predict boundary lines? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's very similar to what uh, Pettiford did. Where was this? Uh, now I'm moving different direction, sorry. So that's what exactly what Pettifer did. And fun fact that Pettifer actually, he, he wasn't chemist, I would say. Yeah, so this very, very complicated map by Pettifer. He wasn't chemist, he was actually from the math department, but he was so passionate about chemistry that he decided to solve it in a mathematical way to solve this problem of classification. And definitely he came up with this chemical scale parameter, which is just fantastic. And for my studies, I just feel that it wouldn't be fair if I just include one more feature as chemical scale parameter by Pettifer because it classifies everything so nicely so that it just simply wouldn't be fair just to include. I just want to find like a simpler correlation like from, from like something like valence electron count sizes and so on. Well, by the way, uh, size is not so obvious chemical property, right? So there are multiple different ways to find out the atomic sizes. Uh, we cannot really like, well, the easiest thing to do is definitely having like uh, um, have X-ray diffraction and basically just measuring the distance between two points at the bond length. But how do you decide that that fraction of space belongs to one atom and that fraction of space belongs to another atom? That's why we have a huge diversity of the size scales and we cannot say that one is correct, another is not. No, it just depends on the approach that we used. And that's why including more size scales, it always helps. That's a really good point. And the same thing goes, by the way, for electronegativity. There is no such thing as the true value of electronegativity. There are over 20 different scales of, of scales of electronegativity. And it is actually a big question. Does the electronegativity help us to classify crystal structures? Or we developed electronegativity scale in order to classify crystal structures. So what comes first? It's also a big question as well. Mm -hmm. And, the, and they also can become so correlated, right? Electron count, electron activity, and atomic size, those are... Obviously. So my approach is like, if I use many different scales, I try to minimize them. When I see like there is a strong correlation, I just want to limit myself to like only one electron activity scale if one of them works better than others. So yeah, the correlation, the same thing as when you do like critical refinement, you just want to avoid that unnecessary correlation of parameters. 
just want to minimize it, have the good enough simple number of like parameters that can solve and refine very well. There is no need to overfit it with more and more parameters. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat and I think we're already 10 minutes over the original plan for, um, for the webinar. So Anton, thank you very much again for the for the fantastic talk and the nice overview of machine learning models. And um, it's great to have you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming.